least there is no country in the world that managed to go from low productivity into high productivity, to diversify the economy, to diversify their exports, to jump, to transform the, the, their economy without involving trade. I mean, export promotion, uh, uh, liberalizing trade to get uh, uh, cost-effective inputs has been at the core in these strategies to transform the economy. So clearly, trade and economic transformation are clearly linked. There is a necessary condition associated to transform the economy that is related to trade. And this goes because domestic market uh, uh, in many developing countries are not large enough to provide the required size, They're basically the scale economies to uh, uh, develop certain activities. They are not big enough to diversify, to have a diversified demand. And competition actually to provide cost-effective inputs in, in goods and services. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, trade is, provides an opportunity to diversify uh, uh, production, to diversify uh, uh, destination of uh, exports and find new uh, uh, capacities, capability, productive capabilities, uh, and of course to, high, to increase uh, value added uh, in production. There is one thing that is related to how trade and economic transformation operates is that if economic transformation has been successful, we also we observe that the production and the structure is more diversified. So there is a sort of, uh, a sort of chicken and egg, but at the end what matters is the relationship of trade. You can enter by first, enter into trade and transform, or basically if you transform you also will uh, ha exhibit more uh, trade. Current negotiations could have contributed to economic transformation, we could say at this stage probably, uh, uh, but basically, clearly, there are some, these of the issues that were, some of the issues that were under discussion, uh, have uh, important implications on how to create production, into uh, uh, create export opportunities, uh, by basically removing some distorting practice uh, that make currently uncompetitive many of these sectors, specifically in agriculture, in fisheries, and, and on e-commerce as well, though there are many opportunities, in some cases for small states, specifically on e-commerce, no, no mention fisheries, uh, where clearly uh, they can help to increase productivity by uh, increasing the output at the exports of the from efficient suppliers. So the removal or the, uh, of distorting practice will make, uh, increase the output from these efficient suppliers to uh, raise uh, 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 global productivity. And of course, this operates under a healthy uh, multilateral system where the three legs of the system, that basically the dispute settlement body, the progressive trade openness, as well as the rule-based disciplines, are the, uh, uh, the key elements of the symbol. So these uh, uh, trade dis uh, uh, disciplines operate within that uh, framework. So specifically on these issues, we have been doing some, some uh, 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 work, and specifically we look into the agriculture, how uh, uh, introducing uh, uh, reductions in the current levels of domestic support, uh, addressing the uh, public support, <coughs> the use of public support, the uh, price uh, support mechanisms to build public stocks, and the, the, the special safeguard, how that affects uh, economic transformation. Uh, and clearly, this is an opportunity, it is an opportunity to uh, uh, help to increase uh, uh, prices, make activities profitable and productive in many developing countries. Specific, for example, in the case of, of public extort holding, uh, uh, we are not saying that countries shouldn't be uh, uh, using stock holding. I mean, clearly there are disciplines that can be used within the WTO to uh, 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 buy stocks and, 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 and used to distribute it. But the use of price support mechanisms help, uh, 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 affects the productivity in the country that provides the support, but also in other countries. Countries such as Bangladesh or Cambodia, that the economic the transformation opportunities are affected by the distortion that the price-based mechanisms to build public so, uh, stock, uh, stockings are uh, uh, is used. On fisheries, it, it clearly fisheries is something that 
fishery subsidies uh, a bit to grind my gears in the sense that these fishery subsidies are very bad, very inconvenient. I mean, these are subsidies to move fleets to the other side of the world uh, in providing many cases a quarter of the fish, fishery subsidies are on fuel, that in no renewable e e e e energy. Uh, in many of these cases, this is supporting uh, illegal fishing. So basically, fishery subsidies affect uh, uh, fish prices and make the uh, reduce the, the, the transformation opportunities in many countries, many of them specifically in the small island states, where actually the diversification, the diversification opportunities are particularly reduced. So actually, this is constrained even more their transformation uh, uh, capacities. The digital economy, and specifically on e-commerce, is another area where there, uh, there are big opportunities for developing countries to transform the economy. This is uh, uh, not only we could think of broad discussion, general discussions about uh, uh, glo global disciplines, about how data is managed, if thinking about uh, 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 data localization or, or privacy law, but basically even uh, policies that countries can adopt themselves by reducing tariff and protection on uh, uh, e-commerce goods or, or, or goods that could be digitally, digit, digitally trade can have important effects on, on, on economic transformation and, and on trade. So clearly these are the issues that, that, uh, uh, that are under discussion at the, uh, at the ministerial, uh, have important, may have important effects on the poorest countries. Of course, these countries uh, will require additional support to actually grasp that opportunity. This is not automatic. It's not just that by doing that, these countries will manage to uh, uh, transform the economy. But clearly, uh, uh, these are the opportunities that these countries can take. This in the context of uh, a, a renewed commitment on uh, the support of a rule-based uh, trade system, including a strong uh, dispute settlement body. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much, Max. That's been a really helpful introduction, uh, so to think around the importance of trade, but also thinking really about the, the current negotiations and how they might uh, contribute uh, uh, to economic transformation. Um, of course, uh, some uh, issues are more likely to conclude than others, um, and, uh, but, but I think the evidence is beginning to build up around, for example, e-commerce, that that can be really important. And also, uh, just to think about the fishery subsidies, I think it's a really good point that Max is making. It's, 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 it uh, has implications for uh, for development, harmful implications for development. It's also harmful for the environment. It's, um, so uh, this, this needs to be uh, thought through um, in much more detail. Right, okay. Um, so we'd now like to sort of go to the rest of the panel. And uh, we're very pleased to have Annabelle Gonzalez here. I know she also has to leave uh, quite soon. So uh, we, we'd like to give you the, the first um, word. And uh, over to you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk, and thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, panel. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, global value chains as a driver of trade and the relationship with the multilateral trading system. But I'd like to, um, before going there, uh, I'd like to um, uh, take the last point that uh, Max was uh, making in his uh, in his great presentation about the importance of a dispute settlement, a strong dispute settlement system for developing countries, with a, with a clear example of how this is not only true, but it is, can also be very supportive of economic transformation in developing countries. And I'll do that with the example of my own country, Costa Rica, which is um, Costa Rica, some 20 something, 25, 30 years ago, was basically a country that produced uh, coffee, bananas, a uh, little bit of sugar, a little bit of beef, uh, and that was mostly it. Huh? After an important uh, economic crisis in the early 80s, it began to think about how can it transform uh, its, uh, its economy. And, um, and one of the first uh, ideas that came to mind was to attract, um, uh, as it happens, quite frequently in a number of countries, 
to attract investment uh, in the textile and apparel area. So um, it began to attract uh, investment and it became uh, quite successful. At that time, um, China was nowhere to be seen in the, in the scenario. This was the late 1990s, uh, mid, mid 1990s, late 1990s. And uh, uh, other countries were not that much there. So the country became quite successful and started exporting to the US. Um, and when it, uh, at some point, uh, it, uh, it, it uh, reached the $100 million exports uh, in uh, textile and apparel, which was uh, a very important number for the country, all of a sudden it confronted a restriction uh, in the U.S. Uh, because uh, U.S. Um, uh, domestic industry was interested in that uh, uh, the plants that were established in Costa Rica would use uh, U.S. fabric instead of fabric uh, brought elsewhere. So they established a restriction that uh, Costa Rica challenged uh, in, the, in the WTO. It was the first case that a small country brought against a large country once the WTO was established. And, uh, and, uh, and Costa Rica won the case in the dispute settlement system. And uh, a year later, uh, the U.S. withdrew uh, the restriction. Uh, and this was very important for the continued uh, uh, growth of the apparel sector in Costa Rica and the continued possibility to attract foreign direct investment. So I, I wanted mm -hmm. to share this because this is a very practical example of how a strong dispute settlement system uh, works for the benefit of developing countries who are trying to transform their uh, economy. Uh, so I want to link this with um, the point about global value chains that I wanted to make because global value chains are indeed a way of uh, transforming the economy. It's a driver of growth uh, and sustainable development for developing countries. Uh, it creates opportunity to diversify the productive uh, structure and participate in global trade. It enables the flow of uh, knowledge uh, and technology. Uh, they can boost productivity in uh, agricultural, manufacturing, services sector, and of course it can generate uh, jobs. And we know of course that a lot of developing countries have used uh, global value chains uh, to, uh, to participate in trade. Of course we know the very successful example of China, but there are others uh, as well. Lesotho, Bangladesh, uh, Ethiopia, for instance, in the apparel sector today, Honduras, uh, southern and eastern African countries uh, in the agribusiness, uh, electronics in East Asia, uh, medical devices in other countries in Latin America, and also in services, uh, um, you know, Philippines, India, Argentina, Jamaica, uh, countries that have all uh, are all participating in global value chains. Now, while Global value chains allow countries to trade. Uh, they present, I think, four features that set them apart from the tra traditional uh, production and trade. One is the customization of production. Second one is a sequential uh, production decisions uh, going from the buyer to the suppliers. The third one is high contracting cost. And the fourth one is global matching of uh, goods and services uh, and of production uh, teams and ideas. So. The expansion of global value chains really needs a trading system that can underpin uh, precisely all these uh, different production processes that, as I said, um, have these characteristics. So um, a part of this has been found in the deeper trade agreements that countries have been signing. And actually, at the World Bank Group, we have found that recent uh, um, uh, research finds a large and positive uh, impact of deep trade agreements on global value chains. Uh, so this is an important point. But of course, uh, global value chains may be regional, but they are also global. And from that perspective, disciplines in the, in the WTO that uh, contribute to address, uh, to minimize trade frictions across countries are very relevant. This is why the Trade Facilitation Agreement is a very important agreement, for instance, for global value chains. And this is why some of the topics that are on the agenda either in this ministerial or in going forward, uh, will continue to be very important for global value chains. Let me just conclude by saying, of course, that trade policy is a necessary enabler, uh, but it's not sufficient or it's not enough uh, for um, fostering participation in global value chains, uh, creating a world-class uh, global value chain links, for example, with export processing zones, uh, something that we are doing, the World Bank, in an pro interesting project in Jamaica, uh, attracting foreign direct investment, strengthening connectivity uh, is important. Uh, it's also important to have a world-class climate for foreign, foreign tangible and intangible assets. 
strengthening GVC local economy links, uh, another very important aspect, strengthening the absorptive capacity of domestic firms uh, through innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, strengthening the skill sets of the, of the population, also quite relevant, um, and implementing climate smart uh, policies and infrastructure are also key. Plus, sector or policies can also, of course, play an important role. But uh, in this context, what I want to highlight is that for the uh, smooth operation, uh, predictable operation, certain operation of uh, GVCs, uh, trade policy plays an important role, and the multilateral trading system uh, is, uh, is, is very important in underpinning the development of global, val global value chains. Okay. Thank you, Thank Annabelle. You. Um, so two issues here uh, that we may come back to later, but I think first issue that she mentioned is about dispute settlement mechanism, that is, that is absolutely crucial and um, in what, when we under, were undertaking this research um, uh, in, in the last half year around fisheries and agriculture um, and e-commerce and you can download the individual papers as well as the summary papers from our website. Um, be discussing uh, current liberalization rounds or perhaps future liberalization rounds on their e-commerce. Um, but we also realize that actually <laughs> some, some other things are happening and if the, uh, and, and not just the liberalization was at, st uh, was at stake, but also the upholding of the, the trade rules are at stake. And I think that is absolutely crucial. And we he heard a very good example here of, of Costa Rica where, uh, where upholding the trade rules are, are really important for their, uh, for, the, for their economic transformation. So that is something that's really important. Uh, and also for developing countries. I think uh, developing countries have, uh, have used the dispute treatment mechanism because it is a uh, quite a lot. And, and in majority of cases in the last two years have been initiated by developing countries and I think it is also seen as a, a sort of a level playing field so I, that is really um, an important area and the other of course issue that you mentioned is around the importance of the trade facilitation agreement uh, sort of, so from Bali onwards um, uh, the Bali Conference onwards for, for, for um, building global value chains and, and I think there's been a lot of attention these days on thinking about transformation that you need to take part in, in, uh, in value chains, and particularly for low-income countries, that's really important. How do you break into these value chains? Uh, and it's good to hear that these agreements are actually helpful uh, for that. Very good. Thank you very much, Annabel. Uh, let's go to Andy McCubri from the Department for International Development. Thank, thank you very much, and thank you to ODI for inviting me today, and also for, for this paper. It's, this sort of analysis is crucial for us as we look towards our revised trade policy uh, over, the, over the coming months as we leave the European Union. Uh, but it's also really helpful time for this sort of research to be coming out. I think we can see quite a significant shift in the narrative on development and aid in the last few years. And certainly the UK government's approach has seen a very significant shift towards economic development work and the work on economic transformation. So while work on health and education, of course, remain extremely important, um, we really have made a major move towards uh, investing in economic development work and, and our portfolio there. Uh, we've increased our annual investment on economic de development to £1.8 billion per year last financial year. That's a doubling of what we were spending in 12-13, in for example. Um, we've, we've, we've started to, uh, to, to invest in a whole range of new programs, looking at commercial agriculture, manufacturing, infrastructure, uh, and, and reinvesting in some innovative regional uh, programs, looking at value chains, for example, like Trademark East Africa, um, uh, also in the last, the last few months and, uh, and, and year or so. We're also trying to shift some of our multilateral support and major investments as well. We really value our partnership with the bank. Uh, we're the largest investor in IDA. And uh, what we've been doing with the bank is to really try and focus some of that work on economic transformation and growth to really leverage, leverage that change. And, um, and we, we're, we're really pleased that the bank is working so closely on us with us on that. And we've also made a major investment into CDC, which is our DFI. Um, over four billion pounds worth of investment over the next five, six years in patient capital, which is imperative for creating jobs and, and tackling some of those hard investment questions in some of these riskier environments. So we're scaling up when we're really investing in our, in our people as well, our capabilities, and we've recently published this year uh, our first economic development strategy to show uh, the strategic shift that we're trying to make in, in the UK government's approach to development in this area. So, so we really welcome uh, the, the push in this area, and re but particularly some of the issues on this report, reducing distortions to trade is, is 
particularly important for agriculture, and I'd like to, to support what, what Max has said. Um, we're, we're trying to, to help shift incentives to produce, to, to produce where it makes sense to do so, and I think some of the examples in the paper, for example, around cotton, uh, where we've really seen very little progress in the last week on this, but I hope we, we will in, in, in the coming months. Uh, but you know where the, the, the odds are really really stacked against some of the, the C4 countries, for example. And the fisheries example has already been made. Uh, again, I, I hope that the, the door is open to some negotiation on, uh, on cutting subsidies for, uh, for, for fishing, and particularly subsidies for illegal fishing uh, in, the coming, uh, in, the, in the coming months after this conference, because it's vital work that, that needs to be addressed. But participation in the, in the economic uh, world is not just about tariffs and subsidies. We do need, as I think uh, Annabelle has said, this wide range of investments, a portfolio approach, and uh, all, of these, all of these types of investments are in the right place. And I think one of the things that it's, it's not everybody's favorite economist, but I was reading some work by Born Lomberg recently. If you're looking to do development, if you're looking to work uh, on poverty, if you're looking to work on reducing suffering, uh, if you look at the returns on investment uh, for where you put your money as a development agency uh, against health, education, even humanitarian work, the return on investment in trade and aid for trade literally is off the chart. So this is the place to be if you want to be working on poverty. The final thought I might leave with you is something that the chair of the conference has, has pushed heavily, DFID has pushed heavily over the last few years, which is the integration of women into economic development and, and getting them working in markets. It's something you'll see a little bit more from the UK government, I hope, and indeed Commonwealth countries over the coming months. Uh, but I would draw your attention to the high-level panel report on women's economic empowerment. If we talk about liberalisation, that's the next frontier for us, and we must all work hard to try and make that, to try and make that happen. Thank you, Andy. That's uh, very good. And also, just to emphasize the important shift that you are undertaking around uh, um, putting more um, uh, emphasis on economic transformation, and that's really, really welcomed. And it's, uh, I mean, it's underlined by the returns to uh, investment in, in aid for trade, for example. And I think that's also what where, uh, where ODI has been doing uh, a lot of work in, into the importance of aid for trade for reducing trade costs, for example. And you mentioned the Trademark East Africa program, which is a, um, an excellent uh, aid for trade uh, program that is helping to reduce trade costs in East African countries. And, um, and in, by doing that, you can help uh, countries to uh, diversify their, their, their economies and building value chains, regional ones and, and hopefully also global ones. And that's, that's really, uh, really important. Very good. Um, sort of in the meantime, we've been joined by uh, Lucio Castro. Uh, welcome uh, here. Um, uh, uh, we've we've had a, a range of uh, presentations and comments, and um, uh, so two development agencies have already uh, commented on the paper by Max, so uh, Annabelle from the World Bank and and Andy from uh, from the Department of International Development. Um, I'd now like to shift to the, the second set of comments. Um, and uh, that's more looking at the country's perspectives on economic transformation and thinking around what the role of trade has been in economic transformation in, in, the, in, in, in these uh, countries. Um, and then, of course, we want to marry up uh, in the discussions around how the trade agreements have helped these countries as well. Um, very good. So let's, let's first go to Patricia Francis. Um, over, over to you. Thank you very much, Dirk, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. I'm very pleased to be part of this panel. I think economic transformation is something which is uh, not unique to developing countries. And of course, we hear uh, large, company, large countries today talking about the inequality of, of trade deals. And um, you know, I have to say to them, welcome to the club, because we thought we were unique in the developing world, but now it's something which uh, seems to be um, all over. Um, Coming from a small island developing state, you know, we, we, we always felt we were, uh, we were unique in the sense that we didn't have much to offer when we went to the table. But still, we were at the table and we, we continue to be at the table and we think it's very, very important. But I think, um, you know, some of the illustrations that uh, we heard this, this morning about distortions with respect to, to fisheries, etc., 
um, are, are still very true to how we all in the ACP countries and also in small island states because we, we grew up on preferences. And that bred a situation where we really were uncompetitive because we didn't have to be competitive. We had our special arrangements. And that way, I think what happened was that really became uh, a, a means of, of really depressing our economies and not allowing for innovation and competitiveness to, to come forward. So I think that um, when we look at all of that, um, clearly, you know, after, after preferences, the commodity agriculture just, uh, just ceased to exist in, in any kind of form which could, which could continue in our, in our economies. And so many of us tried to diversify into financial services, tourism, the ICT sector, and um, I think, you know, when you, when you add to that um, the vulnerabilities that we have with respect to climate, etc., cetera, you, you found that our, our governments were having a very hard time in making this transformation from commodity-based economies to competitive economies that were competing in these new areas. And uh, it, ha it had a great impact on the, the potential for governments to collect revenue from taxation, mm -hmm. et cetera. So there is a kind of perfect storm that, that takes place in, in our economies. Um, and the vulnerabilities become far more exaggerated. But I think that um, you know, when, we, when we look at that, we, we, we have to move forward regardless. So most of the, the Caribbean economies are, are focused on the area of tourism. And we also have uh, some, some, some economies as much as 80% are in the tourism industry. But they have not developed and have not transformed beyond tourism to all of the services that support tourism industry. And even agriculture is not, is not focused on the tourism industry and supporting it. So there are many, many areas where we could, where we could actually do far better. But I wanted to give a quick example of what we could possibly do or what we haven't done um, from our sports industry because uh, Jamaica, for example, has a, a sporting prowess which the rest of the Caribbean does too. But I remember back in the days uh, when we were leading up to the Olympics in Athens, I was traveling in Europe and saw a Jamaican flag on Galleries Lafayette, which is a big department store in France. And I went inside because in those days, I was like Annabelle, responsible for trade and investment in my country. I said, what's happening here? And when I went in, it was Puma having a promotion on Jamaican, a whole line of clothing with a Jamaican flag. I went to Brussels, I saw the same thing, London the same thing, New York the same thing. And when I came back, I was very angry, and I said, well, what's happening here? And what has happened was that our amateur athletic association had given Puma permission to use our Jamaican flag, and in return for uniforms for our athletes, um, shoes and uniforms for our athletes for the Olympics, and 100,000 US for, for uh, Usain Bolt. So I called them on the phone and I said, no, this is, this is, you know, this can't be right. And uh, they said to me, well, you know, so far our sales are coming close to a billion dollars. So I said, well, too late to do anything uh, like a unique product for us. But how about providing us with a village in, in the Olympics mm -hmm. where all of our tourism companies, our food companies can actually display ourselves and you and I can do uh, something complementary. And of course they did that and we continue to do things like that in the future. But what it, what it actually showed, and, and I can give you far more stories about that in our music industry, etc., is that we didn't know how to make money out of the things which we are good at. And this is, this is something where we have to learn in our world how to actually take our assets and make wealth out of it. And uh, so, you know, regardless of, of, of what you want to, 
to say about where the opportunities are in the Caribbean and in many small island states. It's about our culture. It's about what we can do to transform ourselves and really make a product which is diversified and which is of interest to everyone. So I think that you know um, when when you look at when you look at um, some of the other examples in the financial services sector where we are trying to provide some services, well, you know, we, we, are, we are up against um, the, the OECD and their rules, but even when we comply with their rules, we're still, we're still on, on, on the wrong side of the, of the game in that regard. So for us, we have to, to find what is that unique selling proposition how do we go in depth into, the, into those areas? How do we make ourselves uh, special? And uh, I think that today, with the, the advent of e-commerce, that we can actually, as small economies, use e-commerce as a means of getting products and services out there which can differentiate us and which, because of our cachet out there, either in sports, music, entertainment, or whatever, we can actually uh, make and have good opportunities in, in that regard. I wanted quickly just to, to, um, to mention the, the high-level panel on uh, women's economic empowerment, which I was pleased to be part of, because I think here again, um, women are critical and important element in our economy is to ensure that we, we find ways to ensure that they actually can move up into, into these small, in, from small industries into more defined industries. And um, that was a, a very unique, if you've never heard about it, you should go and look at their website because they have come up with lots of ways in which you can, you can actually empower your women. And, uh, case studies about how others have done it. So I think it's very critical and important in any economy at all that you make sure that your women are doing as well as your men. And uh, I think that um, there's, there's much food for thought in that regard. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave it there and be happy to mm -hmm. get back in at some other point. Okay, Patricia, thank you very much. And uh, sort of highlighting some of the challenges uh, to transformation in, um, in the Caribbean. Um, but also, um, while well, saying that uh, the e-commerce discussion may may uh, help help uh, countries like uh, like yours um, to uh, to transform uh, into the future, so putting a lot of faith in that, uh, which is um, which is good. Um, but also um, saying that uh, there are challenges. Um, to transformation that are global, there are global issues here, and that also developed countries, and that's where you started out with, also mm -hmm. have challenges of economic transformation, and um, maybe it's not at country level, but in particular regions. I mean, I, uh, I live in the United Kingdom, so uh, for example, in Northern England, uh, I wish there had been more economic transformation, more job creation, um, so that there had been more support for uh, for trade, uh, for example, um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure the same would, uh, would apply in, in, in the US, and I think the, it's really important to think about the type of transformation that, 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 that you uh, encourage uh, with trade and also um, think about what are the complementary measures that, uh, that you can put in place uh, in, in a country. Um, and also think about some of the social groups um, uh, within this um, and within this context, and um, highlighting in particular also the contribution that uh, um, that women can make to transformation. Both Andy and Patricia uh, were mentioning that. Now, um, I, I'm, sh I'm sure we're going to hear more now on the, uh, the sort of the political nature of uh, of economic transformation in um, uh, in, in Argentina. Um, but I think we um, it, it, it's a very interesting story to hear around how. Um, your uh, your ministry has come about, uh, or your your secretariat has come about, because it is focusing on, on transformation, and also it will be very interesting to hear how Argentina is using trade to to contribute to economic transformation. <laughs> Over to you, Lucia. Okay, thank you all. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me first try to outline what we think in general. What's our the road ahead for Argentina. Uh, we think that the main objective of our government is to become a normal country. Argentina has to become a normal country. And we consider that Argentina has to be a developing economy. We are a high-middle-income economy. 
And the road ahead of that, we can divide this in terms of our term in government. We have been only two years here in the government in Argentina in three different phases. The first one that we call the normalization of the economy, trying to tame inflation, going back to international capital markets, eliminating the myriad of export restrictions that we have here in Argentina. We're one of the few countries with export quotas, export taxes, all the restrictions that you can think on our own exports. And maybe, more importantly, to normalize our import regime. So we basically try to go back to the, to the world in that way. So that was the first phase, and that basically encompassed most of the first year that we were in government. The second phase of our government is kind of encompassed or encapsulated in something that we call the National Productive Plan. The National Productive Plan has at its heart basically the objective of improving productivity across the whole economy. But, and this is, I think, crucial, and that something is completely linked with what Dirk was saying, we see productivity, improving productivity, as a means for a goal. And this goal is creating jobs, particularly jobs in the private sector. Argentina has a problem which is common to many developing countries, which is poverty. Around a third of the population is under, under the poverty line. And we believe in our government that the only way we can fight against poverty is by creating private jobs, jobs in the private sector. So we launched this National Productive Plan that has eight different pillars with this idea of improving productivity across the whole economy. And let me just tell you what we have been doing in these eight pillars. The first one is reducing the cost of capital. Right now, Argentina, the country risk, so the, the, the cost for Argentina for issuing debt international capital markets is closer to the Brazil. Brazil didn't have any default on its external debt. Argentina was out of the international capital markets for the last 10 years. So we reduce significantly the cost of capital. The second, cap the second uh, pillar is improving infrastructure. Argentina, in the last decade, destroyed the stock of infrastructure of roads, energy, telecommunications. We launched it and implemented the most ambitious infrastructure plan in our history. Third one, Argentina has an extremely complicated uh, labor regulation. So we sent to Congress, and right now we are discussing that, a very ambitious, but at the same time, gradual reform of our labor market. And we are working heavily on eliminating all the obstacles to jobs creation in the private sector. Third one, Argentina, and that's another inheritance from the previous government, has right now one well, of the highest tax pressure in all the developed world, developing countries' world. Right now, if you add up all the different taxes in all the different uh, government levels, the national, subnational, including provincial and municipal uh, taxes, the tax pressure is around 45% of the GDP. So it's one of the highest in the developing world. So we sent to Congress a law for a very ambitious, but at the same time, gradual reform of our tax regime over a period of five years. Another thing that is a pillar in the National Productive Plan is eliminating red tape. And that's a phenomenon that obviously affects most of the developing countries. Our calculation is that if we eliminate red tape at the national level, or the, only at the national level, we can transfer resources to the private sector that equal around 1% of the GDP, just by eliminating red tape at the national level at the national state. Another pillar is facilitating access to technology. And we are working here in different uh, areas. Maybe the most crucial one, Argentina was very special when we arrived to govern in 2015. We have tariff on computers. As a result, computers in Argentina, laptops, anything related with informatics, was around 100% higher, more expensive than any other country in Latin America. We eliminated tariffs on computers. Prices not only fall down, but also increase the quality of the computers in Argentina. And this is something very important. It's linked also for some of the things we have been listening in this panel. The way we did this. We did this with a view of, at the, at the same time, with two goals. On the one hand, 
facilitating access to a crucial technology for the whole economy, which has an encompassing a cross-sector effect on productivity, computers, electronics, but at the same time focusing on keeping jobs and focusing on workers. So we created last year a very innovative program, the transformation, Productive Transformation Program. It's a joint program with the Ministry of Labor and the Ministry of Production that basically provides help for displaced workers in any kind of uh, measure related with trade opening or with trade measures. So this is something very innovative that we implemented last year and we used in this case of uh, the, the transformation of the computers market. Another thing that is also another pillar in our national productive plan is competition policy. Another common feature in many developing countries is that we have not only few companies, but we usually have very concentrated markets with few players. So competition usually is quite low. And that obviously uh, entails for consumers high prices and bad quality in terms of the products that are produced. So we relaunched competition policy in Argentina, we sent a new law to Congress, and we passed for the first year in our history a measure, in, the case, in this case, in the credit card market, that ended up in the deinvestment of a previously monopoly in that particular market. So the company was basically the monopoly in the credit, market, credit card company, credit card market, deinvested there, and that we are demonopolizing, deregulating that particular market. And finally, and that goes back what uh, Dirk was asking at the beginning, and this is maybe the most delicate, but at the same time the most important pillar in our national productive plan, what we call the intelligent integration into the global economy. And I think all the words here are important. Because we are convinced, and President Macri uh, underscored this in his opening speech at the WTO conference, that we have to be extremely careful. Obviously, every country has to integrate into the global economy. There are huge benefits from international trade, but there are also some challenges. And these challenges have names and surnames. There are certain people who can be damaged by if you open too fast and without any kind of complementary measures. So we think that you have to integrate into the global economy, but, in, but at the same time in an intelligent way. What have we have been doing on this front? We are very close, um, I, I cross my fingers on this, to close an agreement with the European Union, between Mercosur and the European Union. This is the most ambitious FTA, free trade agreement, that the Mercosur bloc has negotiated in the last 20 years, or its own whole history, and we are trying to open up other uh, FTAs uh, at the same time. Um, so these are the eight pillars that we are working with this idea of improving productivity <coughs> across the whole economy. The next step for us, and that's very close to the things that you have been discussing in this conference, is what we call the knowledge economy. So we think that the next couple of years, Argentina is facing a challenge, but at the same time has a huge opportunity to participate significantly in this knowledge economy that is uh, opening up right now in the global markets. Maybe you're not aware of that, but Argentina is one of the few countries in Latin America that has a very large knowledge-intensive services sector. Four out of nine of the unicorns, companies that value of more than one billion dollars, were born here in Argentina. These are companies that basically dominate the Latin American market. Companies are similar to Amazon, Mercado Libre, OLX, other companies are basically playing the major leagues of the knowledge intensive sector. So we believe that there is a huge opportunity for Argentina in that market. Another important thing to keep in mind there, right now the knowledge intensive services sector is the third largest generator of export in Argentina. So it's a, it's a, it's a sector that is already there huge com with huge comparative advantage, but at the same time we believe that we can construct economic development policy around this sector to increase productivity, not only in the knowledge intensive sector, but across different sectors in our economy. Okay, thank you very much, Lucio, and thank you, Annabelle, for 
contributing to the panel. I know you have to leave. So thank you. Um, so, Lucio, thank you. That's been really, um, uh, really helpful to, to explain uh, the, the process that you're undertaking at the moment to, to increase productivity across the board. And I think that is uh, fundamental to economic transformation. It's you need to think around uh, uh, moving up the value chain um, and, and raising productivity. And most of our work actually in the, in the program is working at country level, thinking around uh, um, what can be done to, uh, to move uh, transformation uh, ahead. Um, also very interesting to hear about the example of the, uh, the, the, laptops, uh, the laptops example and uh, how you've reduced tariffs uh, whilst at the same time providing some, some assistance there uh, and thinking about intelligent um, integration into the economy and I think that is something we all need to think uh, a lot about is that it's not just globalization everywhere everywhere um, that has uh, that's got to have priority everywhere it is thinking really intelligently where is the biggest bang for the buck um, in terms of globalization or targeted globalization but also thinking about who's winning who's losing uh, in the uh, in the process and that uh, that is very important so um, I think what we've heard is, um, uh, is a range of contributions talking around um, the importance of, uh, of trade for, um, uh, for economic transformation. Um, I think most would, uh, would agree on that. Um, uh, there are, of course, challenges uh, that are currently uh, uh, taking place. But we've also heard that I think negotiations can be uh, particularly helpful. So trade policy negotiations could be helpful. Um, the trade facilitation agreement was mentioned. I think uh, agriculture and fisheries uh, have been mentioned. Also e-commerce uh, uh, negotiations have been mentioned by uh, Patricia and I think also implicitly in, in, in Lucio's um, uh, discussion um, as well. Um, and not just the negotiations I've mentioned, but also the rules that are also important. So Annabelle mentioned about the rules. So I suppose, um, and, and I think finally we've heard about the, the sort of the political nature of the, pro of the process. So we've got a, quite a few issues on the table here um, that, we, uh, that we can discuss. Us. Um, what I'd like to do now is sort of t maybe take one or two or three uh, questions um, uh, from the panel and then, uh, uh, sorry, from the audience and then um, uh, go back to the panel and to see whether you want to, to respond. Okay, uh, I think a gentleman here in the front um, and then at the back. Well, just a simple question. Maybe you could um, introduce yourself. Uh, this is Murat Yulek. I am the director of Center for Industrial Policy and Development, Istanbul Commerce University, Turkey. Um, I was just, uh, although I missed, you know, some of the speakers, but I wanted to also hear something about industrial transformation. Mm -hmm. The Latin American countries, they mm -hmm. are, uh, you know, exporters of uh, mostly, I can say, agricultural uh, products mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the beginning of the century, Argentina, for example, was a very rich country based on, you know, the endowment of natural resources and so on, and now it's not that rich. And now we are hearing about from uh, Lucio that, you know, there's a new transformation, etc., etc. But where is the, not only in Argentina, maybe in Jamaica or other countries, where, where does industrial sector stand in, in the transformation process? One uh, particular observation, my first time in Argentina, I saw that, uh, you know, it's a very expensive country. I can tell you that it's very expensive, uncompetitively expensive. And part of the reason probably is that I think, although I don't know the statistics, but there must be a, a huge uh, um, a real exchange rate appreciation. Where does that stand in, for example, Argentina's uh, mm -hmm. transformation, including the info, uh, industrial one? Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, the gentleman at the, at the back. Yeah, my, my name is Hong Song from China, and uh, I have three questions. Yeah, first one is about the uh, small countries uh, of uh, Caribbean. Uh, especially for the uh, financial sector development. And uh, from you, uh, OECD side, uh, side uh, some of the small countries to be a uh, tax uh, haven. And uh, my question is that is, uh, if, if uh, some of the small uh, current countries to be a uh, tax haven, what's the benefit from these uh, uh, positions as a tax haven uh, in the world? 
Second question about the Argentina, about uh, you mentioned about the intelligent integrations with the world economy. So what's the mean uh, by intelligent? And uh, what's the difference from the uh, past? The third question is uh, about the uh, institution uh, uh, impact for uh, Latin American uh, development. Because uh, last uh, sessions, uh, we get this idea that uh, the Latin American face a lot of changes, and also, especially in the future. Uh, what's the reasons for the yeah, challenges many come from the institutions? So, uh, uh, can, can this panelist give us uh, the more explanations for what's the meaning and what type of the institutions uh, impact for the, this regional development? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, lady over here. Thank you. Judith Fessehaye, uh, ICTSD. Thank you for the very interesting um, interventions. It was very interesting to listen to. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, so for the past 15 years, most of the African countries have been grappling with the big question of what to do with the commodity sectors. Commodity price boom, everybody thought they could do something on economic transformation, not so much diversifying away from the commodity sectors, but using the commodity sectors by developing backward linkages, forward, forward linkages, uh, development corridors. So really for 10, 15 years, all we heard in Africa, but imagine it was a similar discussion in Latin America was, what can we do with the mineral, with the agricultural sectors to actually promote economic transformation? And my impression is that now there is a bit of disillusionment, that maybe countries have not gone as far as they should have, and commodity prices are falling, and maybe the window is closing for these opportunities. So I just wanted to, have, to hear your thoughts on this, especially because most of you have worked in a number of countries, so you have experiences across the continent. And the second question is um, discussing about trade, um, multilateral trade. So the G90 made a very specific they made very specific proposals in terms of how to change trade rules to support economic transformation. Um, what do you think of it? Uh, do you think the trade rules are fine and we should just focus on changing the domestic uh, policy setting? Or do you think there's a problem there in terms of the specific proposals they have on, you know, TRIMS, SPS, TBT, etc.? Thank you. Okay. Uh, maybe the final question here and then we go back to the panel. You know, Cara. Thanks very much. I'm Cora Jord from the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency. A very interesting uh, discussion. My question was uh, slightly similar. Uh, just to add that um, there's a lot of interest, I think, from especially African governments um, on, the, uh, on the need for policy space to kind of um, encourage um, uh, transformation and uh, diversification. Um, and they look with, with some interest on the sometimes unorthodox policies from the East Asian Tigers and some governments in, in East Africa or, for example, um, they have proposed an, a ban on secondhand clothing to encourage uh, more um, uh, movement of economic activity into new sectors. Um, is there uh, any um, merit to this kind of argument, you think? Uh, is it, uh, or is it in complete contrast to the evidence on um, openness and predictability uh, as, as a means to encourage trade and investment flows. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, these are um, a range of uh, questions covering, I suppose, the whole economy. Um, uh, thinking around uh, industrialization first, I think there was a question on that. Um, and so what is the, the role of industrialization? I suppose maybe linking it to the, to the theme of, 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 of this session, and in particular the, the Picking also up the last question, I think, uh, the, uh, around what is the role between sort of trade policy and industrialization? Um, how do you industrialize? What are pragmatic models of industrialization? Uh, how do you use trade in this? Uh, or do you close yourself off against trade, for example? Is that, that the answer? So that, I suppose, is one, one question we, we want to raise. Um, the other was around using the commodity sector. Um, so how do you use the commodity sector to transform your economy? Um, I suppose maybe with that comes the real effective exchange rate issue that also been highlighted. Um, and then I think there was an issue around institutions and also tax havens, financial services perhaps, sort of the issue around financial services. So uh, a range of questions here. Um, and there was the, the Mitumba ban, which I think would be part of the industrialization 
uh, question. So maybe, Max, you want to go first, and then, um, then I'll just go around the panel. Uh, you don't have to take all the questions. You just yeah. maybe take just one. No, no. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think I would take on the, on the issue of the manufacturing sector and the industrial sector. Clearly, this is a sector that is key for reasons that are known in terms of how easy you can transform uh, 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 use uh, uh, employment coming from the rural sector into the, the manufacturing sector. It's a key sector. However, uh, uh, we have a very interesting discussion earlier, is uh, uh, you need to think further than the typical industrial policies to develop the manufacturing sector. Increasingly, the services is extremely important in the productivity of the manufacturing sector. Mm -hmm. So actually, is industrial policy increasingly is about to put in place a lot of services, a lot of things that would not be considered as typical of manufacturing to be in place. We have done some work specifically on how the services sector contribute to increase the productivity in the manufacturing sector in developing countries. So clearly, the manufacturing sector remains key, but it's increasingly not only the, the only sector that you need to put an eye on this. Uh, uh, in terms of the uh, 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 sort of the commodities and the dissolution, I think that there might have been a story, or, or I was thinking of, uh, 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 put it in terms of a, a Dutch disease type of phenomenon that happened. I mean, and it happened with, at the same time with, for example, the negotiations in agriculture. I mean, there wasn't too much interest for many developing countries in pushing for negotiations in agriculture in the last 10 years because the prices of commodities were very high. So actually, you actually, you don't have the need. I remember when I was in, 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 in the Minister of Agriculture here in the early 2000s, is when the so mice, I'm looking there because of the, the, the board with the prices, so they were around very low. I mean, a third of the price there are today, it was critical getting an agreement on. on so, so, so I clear that the story of the dissolution is because Commodity prices were too high. Um, we could, uh, uh, we were succeeding in exporting countries. African countries were succeeding in exporting those those products, and they didn't worry at that stage on actually developing the linkages of that sector into the agricultural sector, moving into thinking of providing agricultural services, whether in working in terms of uh, uh, developing the uh, uh, agricultural machinery, for example. They didn't have that sort of, that would be my, my take. And in terms, for example, uh, on the uh, uh, point about the, the second-hand clothing uh, uh, ban and, and, and the mitumba in, 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 in East Africa, we have been doing some work around that. And um, Well, clearly, it, it's, it's something that you are trying to introduce a ban uh, uh, that uh, not something that affects the, the livelihood of many people in, in, in those countries, and that at the end of the day, you countries don't have the capacity to supply clothes with new clothes in those markets. So actually, what you expect that will happen is that those countries that introduce the ban, what they have is going to have an influx of imports of cheap clothing from Bangladesh or China, so at the end, the intention of using that ban to develop the, your own manufacturing sector uh, uh, was uh, 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 pointed. Mm -hmm. And also, you have the issue, and specifically in the East African countries, that even if that was a good idea, they actually, they didn't work in making that a coordination within the East African community. So it was, each of the countries said, well, I'm going to do this, and I didn't care what the rest of the countries of East Africa do. Okay. So I think that would be Thanks. Uh, I would like to bring in the other panelists. Andy, would you like to um, take well, questions? On, on industrialization, I think, uh, I think the, the point that Max made about linking it back into services is absolutely critical. Um, it's also a difficult thing to do. We're, we're piloting our own program at the moment. It's called Invest Africa, uh, working in four, four African countries. We're looking to, to, to bring in $400 million uh, of, of, uh, of FDI uh, to, to, to create uh, 90,000 jobs over the next 10 years. But it's difficult patient work, and you need to be, everything needs to be very carefully tailored to the common context. And I think sometimes this brand of industrialization, I'm not automatically clear what people mean when they use it in different contexts. And I think it's, uh, so the, the point is well made, but it, it needs to be extremely well tailored. 
structured back into to the wider economy and, and very careful patient-tailored evidence-based work about what is going to work in particular circumstances. Um, I, just, just on one or two other issues, I would agree with Max. I won't repeat it on the Matumba issue. I think, that, that's, I think the, the point is well made there. The issue around uh, the, the developing countries and the developed countries at this conference, you, you, you spoke about SPS and the, 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 the treatment issue, uh, differentiation issues. I, um, it's, a, it's very heated. It's very difficult, and there are arguments. If I take my, my own government hat off for a minute, it's, you can see arguments on both sides. But I think, um, let's see what happens in the next 24 hours. But there needs to be some very careful reflection on both sides to, to come to a common agreement. It's, um, but it's important that both sides are able to see, to, to find common ground soon on what will work, particularly for the least developed countries and perhaps those elmics. Uh, as well, because that it is, it, there are there are real real grievances and real challenges there that that are very strongly held. So, um, uh, but I'm not sure that we'll see too much progress uh, in in the immediate future. But we must must all work harder to, to find something. And I think the Norwegian chair of the development group is keen keen to do that. Mm -hmm. Very good. I like your phrase, careful reflection. <laughs> That's what we do <laughs> um, here. I suppose the. Um, I mean, I think the issue around policy space and trade and economic transformation uh, is an important issue. Uh, and the challenge, of course, with, with, with policy space is you need to use it well. And I think it is the, um, it's very often that, uh, or sometimes, that policy space might be interpreted as, uh, as, as doing nothing and being building up uh, uh, capabilities behind protective walls. And I think that's, uh, that's uh, that history doesn't show that that's been uh, particularly helpful over a sustained period of, uh, of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, all countries, uh, um, uh, so like Korea, for example, it couldn't rely on its, uh, its own market. It had to export, and I think Argentina is now also uh, using trade. Uh, and, uh, and so that thinking much more around the importance of trade and, and, and proactively using the state proactively as facilitating trade, facilitating industrial product production, um, using special economic zones or skills and technology uh, uh, or, 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 or so, 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 such issues. And I think that's where policy space, of course, could be, uh, could be, um, it be used well positively, but it doesn't intervene, contravene some of the rules, trade rules. Um, uh, Patricia and uh, Lucia. Well, I, I, before I get to the tax haven thing, I would like to say something about industrialization because I sit on the board of a company that was a purely agricultural company, fully integrated in transportation and distribution. But with the collapse of the preferences, that market went away. And, and basically, that company has had to transform itself into an industrial force now, using their, their agricultural base to create snacks. And th those snacks are now being sold um, and, and produced in the countries where we, where we used to grow bananas. We, we now make snacks. And uh, we not only make snacks out of bananas, but we make it out of all other kinds of agricultural products, um, yams and, and uh, sweet potatoes and all sorts of other things. Um, and, and so when, when you look at the value of the company today, uh, the value of the company today has increased and what used to be the shipping and distribution network that we had has now been transformed into a logistics company which is uh, providing logistics not just to the agricultural industry but to um, a myriad of industries. So um, this is why I believe that the preferences were something that, that, um, that restricted this development because you are very comfortable in the space of, of being in commodities. And, and so I say to, to uh, when we look at Africa and, and what is it that Africa has to do in terms of transforming its own agricultural base into, into an industrial force, I think that there is a huge opportunity there, but then it, it, it will need partnerships, it will need um, a myriad of services around it 
in order to make that happen because you have to have the quality control mechanisms, you have to have uh, you know, the packaging industries, you have to have all of the different things that are going to make an industry work. And I think uh, company, countries have to begin to think about what is it that I'm going to do in order to transform my fledgling cotton industry? How do I, how do I move up the value chain? Or is this something that I need to do, look at uh, cotton, cotton countries across, uh, say, West Africa, for example, or East Africa, because there are, there are different values, uh, there are different kinds of cotton that are being grown there, and therefore I could, I could become a specialist in particular strains of, of cotton. But from my experience of working in Africa and, and what we were doing there before, um, it was, it was purely about putting a commodity into a bag. There were no quality controls in there, so you, you weren't even getting uh, the prices from, that you could have from just having a mechanism for quality control of what went into what kind of bag. So there were even values that could have been created from not doing anything different other than just having quality control systems in place. So I think that, um, you know, uh, looking, looking at what we have to be doing in the Caribbean, I mean, I'm also involved in a coffee company that, that has had to um, look at not just selling out green beans, but also processing coffee to, um, to the final product and all kinds of other kinds of coffee confectionery that are going along with it processing and making instant coffee, um, looking at up and down the scale what you can do. So I think it's, it's very important that, that countries look at the whole value chain of what exists, but it's not going to be me, myself, and I working together. You've got to ha come together and, and look at the, the market and determine how do you how do you in, how do you engage in that market? How are you going to move forward in that market? And where are the opportunities? Because many times we're trying to sell a product which has no relationship to the market. We need to understand the market, work backwards, and then come up with what we're going to do. As far as the you know tax havens are concerned, you were talking about financial services here. And uh, Caribbean countries are not doing anything different to what, uh, what is happening in so-called tax havens in Europe, but we are treated very differently. But you, you have very um, high-level jobs in, in that because here um, it's not about tax evasion, it's about how you manage, how you manage your money. And so you have people uh, in these in these companies that are that are, are managing money, looking at the whole question of insurance, looking at you know where where are the best returns on investment. So the, the quality of the jobs that you have in the financial services sector are far higher than we have say in our call centers. Um, those are mainly uh, low level low level jobs coming straight out of a high school kind of graduate graduation uh, uh, qualification so um, you know i think I think because since since the financial crisis, there has been this big focus on you know where is the money um, when everybody was flush with cash, nobody was really worried about where the money was. Uh, but now everybody is trying to make sure that they get their piece of the taxation. But it's important that when OECD countries are looking at that, they're also looking at the flip side. Because there are many countries, say in Africa and probably in Latin America here, certainly in the Caribbean, where uh, um, money is being uh, siphoned off into... into uh, into the United States, into England, into Luxembourg, into Switzerland. And uh, so our countries are not getting the proper taxation. So when we begin to talk about taxation as a double-sided game, and we ought to be talking about how we are also collecting our tax on our side, and uh, the money that you have in your first world countries that belong rightfully to us, um, you know, where, where is the reciprocity? So it's not really an equal game that's being played. 
and uh, there, there, is, there should be more dialogue on this, because of course certainly what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and we would like to see real uh, reciprocity and uh, real transparency in the financial markets so that we can all benefit and that uh, we have a level playing field. Mm -hmm. Patricia, thank you. Um, Lucio, we heard uh, a lot from you on the knowledge economy and the sort of remarkable achievements there. But what about the ro role of the industrial sector, the manufacturing sector? Um, how do you see that in, uh, in Argentina? Is it a step back, a step forward? Um, how, how, how are trade agreements uh, being used uh, to develop your industrial sector? Well, let, let me divide my answer in, in four. The, the first part of my answer would be uh, related to what Max was saying is that you have to see the industrial sector within the global context. It's a global context dominated by the phenomena of automation, global value change, and finally diversification. So it's a completely different context from what you saw in the 1970s or 1960s. So, and the second part is we have a, an integrated approach of the economy. If you see the case of Argentina, maybe it's different from other developing countries, we have a well-diversified economy. You have a strong, vibrant, extremely competitive, one of the most com competitive agricultural sectors in the world. You have a large and extremely competitive knowledge-intensive services sector. And you have a quite well-developed and quite important industrial base here in Argentina. The first exporting sector in Argentina is soybean and cereals. The, the second one is the automobile sector. Second one. Argentina, maybe you are not aware of this, is uh, the only place besides Thailand where Toyota is fabricating here, is uh, producing the Hilux. Hilux is one of the most important trucks for all the world. And we are exporting trucks in Argentina to Chile, to Peru, to Central America, to South Africa, to North Africa, even to Australia. We are extremely optimistic about the future of our industrial sector. We believe we have a future. If you look at certain spots in the industrial sector here in Argentina, and the manufacturing, the automobile sector is one very good example. If you look at the Toyota factory here in Buenos Aires, here in Campana, just a half an hour from the city of Buenos Aires, the productivity levels are similar or even higher than a factory in Japan. So we have the same thing. The problem starts when you leave the factory. So you are facing there all the problems that we have in developing country, related to logistics, related to taxes, related to all the things that have been talking before. But we believe we have here a future. Something else I would like to add on that. I think it's also related to what Max was saying before. One thing that I think defines a developing econ economy is the huge variance that you find in film level productivity within each sector. So if you look at the Argentinian economy, even sectors that you would believe in a high, middle high income economy like Argentina, sectors that are extremely intensive in, in low skill um, work, for instance, the textile sector, the clothing sector, the shoemaking sector, you find there are some firms that are extremely competitive, they're exporting, that in some spots in the market, they're number one in the region. Maybe the sector as a whole is not competitive, but you find certain spots in the value of change that are extremely competitive. So again, we have an optimistic view of this, and we believe that we have to increase productivity across the whole economy, and the industrial sector in that sense has a future. I think the final um, response to, to that particular question is what we should do in terms of policy. Well, some of the things we have been doing, uh, I described that before, but I think we have two priorities for the near future. The first one is financing. Argentina is a country that is a start of financing. If you look at just a rough measure of financial development, credit over GDP is around 15%. So it's more similar to an African country to a high middle income country like Argentina, much lower than Turkey and other countries similar to our own country. So we have a huge, huge challenge ahead, 
But we also believe in that way that not only by taming inflation, normalizing the economy is enough. We created two years ago something that is new for Argentina and also innovative, a development bank, but a modern development bank, not like the, more, the development banks that you saw in the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1980s. This development bank, is called BICE, works in the following way. This bank tries to complete markets or create markets, working jointly with the private sector, with the financial sector, the private financial sector. The second goal of this development bank is financial inclusion, particularly for SMEs. And we are working quite heavily there. Just to give you an example, one of the sectors in Argentina that, as I mentioned before, is kind of thriving, is the knowledge intensive business services. Within that particular sector, we have the software industry. The software industry does not have any kind of collateral. So every time you go to the bank, the bank does not lend you because you don't have nothing to offer for that particular uh, loan. So we created an innovative financial solution for this particular segment of the uh, knowledge intensive services sector. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of way we are doing. Completing markets, creating new markets, working jointly with the private sector. And finally, and I think uh, two other um, policy measures here we are working quite heavily. We think that for the industrial sector, another challenge is adopting and also moving forward in terms of the technological revolution. So one thing that we include in the law that we sent to Congress, the tax reform law, is a tax rebate system exactly identical to an OECD country for R&D. So you can basically deduct from your income tax, any investment you do in R&D, research and development. Simple, transparent, automatic, and that basically is to provide an incentive for the demand for this investment in research and development. And the second thing that we are doing on this technological transformation, we are investing quite heavily in terms of the uh, technological transfer centers. We are basically looking to uh, other models, for instance, the German model, the Basque Country model, where at the heart of the industrial transformation, you have this very particular type of institutions that work as a bridge or as a link between the scientific community, the ones that produce basic research, and the business community. So we are investing on that, and we are betting that it's going to be one of the game changers for the industrial mm. sector in the next years mm. ahead. Okay. And finally, we are also working in terms of something that we believe is crucial. When you look at the industrial sector in Argentina, when you look at the whole economy in Argentina, one of the things that strikes you is the lack of skilled workers. Where we said in Argentina we don't have enough engineers, but we don't have also in Argentina enough skilled workers. And if you look at where you have the highest uh, degree of um, the lack of these skilled workers, you will think, well, they are in the knowledge intensive sector, like the software industry. No, no. You have also in the industrial sector, for instance, in the metal manufacturing sector, a massive restraint in terms of finding skilled workers. So in the labor uh, reform law that we sent to Congress, we are changing the whole system for providing professional training because we think that one of the huge challenges, not only for the industrial sector, but for the whole labor market in Argentina and in other developing countries, to basically face the challenge of automation is how you adapt the labor force to the demand from the private sector in terms of new skills. So that's something that we are. And let me just finalize one thing on the intelligent integration into the global economy. And I think that's a very good question. It's not so difficult. I think uh, we believe that we have a different approach to uh, the integration into a global economy in comparison to other times or other governments here in Argentina. We don't have a naive view on that. We believe that, again, the, global integra the integration into the global economy is a tool for a mean. It's an instrument for a goal. 
And that goal is poverty reduction. That goal is creating jobs in the private sector. And therefore, we believe that the, the, the defining feature of the Argentinian economy right now is low productivity. We have some sectors, some regions with very low productivity, and therefore we have to be extremely cautious and gradual in the way we are integrating to the global economy to focus, obviously, always on jobs, not only protecting jobs, but most importantly, creating new jobs for our population. Okay, Lucio. So as the host, you had the, uh, the final word. So we have one minute left. I suppose I'll uh, um, uh, summarize um, briefly, um, uh, or maybe I shouldn't attempt to do that in the, in the time available. I suppose, um, uh, I mean, there's, of course, a lot of discussion around current trade negotiations and the state of those. And, um, and there are lots of challenges out there. So we do think, that, of course, it's important to to carry on with, uh, uh, with the negotiations, to think about a rules-based system. Um, but I think what we're also hearing uh, is, uh, is sort of the intelligent integration argument and that we need to be much smarter at uh, engaging with the global economy. And it is uh, uh, not uh, one of either extremes and say, we, uh, we want to just liberalize everywhere, rules everywhere, at the expense of everything uh, necessarily. And it's, on the other hand, it's also not protecting yourself against rule, uh, protecting your, yourself against trade, uh, having 100% maximum policy space uh, to do things. And I think, therefore, what we now need to be thinking around is, is just the smart integration and then really think about where do we want to go with, with our economy, so like the bottom-up approach, and how do, does trade fit in this picture and therefore how do trade agreements fit within this, this picture and it's, it, it is the f much more the smarter discussion that we need to have and I think that's something that maybe I will, I will take away from, from, uh, from today's uh, discussion and that we uh, can still uh, in two years time have another TSDS where we can discuss economic transformation um, and uh, where we hopefully some trade rules um, uh, have further developed, some negotiations have further developed but at the same time that we, we carry on with this important uh, uh, job of trans of transforming the economy using trade in the, uh, in the process so that we can uh, create jobs and that's so important um, uh, for, the, for the population. So I'd like to thank all the, the panelists um, uh, for, for their contributions and also thank the audience for the questions and I suppose you can now also, uh, um, so one-to-one -one questions, maybe the panelists will stay on to, to discuss further. Uh, one final thing, if you'd like, if you're interested in the, the work um, by the Supporting Economic Transformation Programme, you can go to the website. Um, there are lots uh, of papers, country-based papers, but also issue-based papers, gender and transformation, services and transformation, transformation, industrialization and transformation in particular areas. So you can, um, you can look into that and just drop us an email if you're, if you're interested. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming.